A titanium wheel, scrap metal, and the remains of a lunar probe. Bags of dirt, commemorative medals and ragged flags. A golf ball and a footprint. So many clues left on the ground struggle to bear witness to the fierce competition launched by the USSR and the United States for the conquest of the moon. The battle began on the Soviet side, the night of October 4th, 1957, at 10.28 p.m. in the region of Baikonur. A rocket 30 meters high rose above the frozen fog of the Aral Sea. It released the first Sputnik. An American listening station picked up the satellite signal. It's the Cold War, and the whole world was stunned. And this 90-minute flight did more for the USSR than 40 years of propaganda. Communism was displaying its superiority over capitalism, announced the Soviets, relishing their triumph. The New York Herald Tribune headlined the great defeat of the United States. A month later, Nikita Khrushchev, leader of the USSR, provides an encore. And to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, the designer of the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev, sends Laika into space aboard Sputnik 2. In a masterpiece of propaganda timing, the Soviet Union announced it had launched Sputnik number 2, carrying a live dog. Yet behind the scientific success lies a grim military warning. The rocket is capable of carrying a ton and a half. Mass hysteria takes hold of the free world and the United States fear missile attacks from the Soviets. The Soviets will never say that Laika, their new heroine, failed to survive the flight. Two months after Sputnik 1, a U.S. Navy Vanguard rocket explodes before the eyes of the authorities. The last months of 1957 are tough for the Americans. Somewhat sarcastically, Khrushchev sends his condolences. America is stunned. So President Eisenhower announces the creation of NASA, an aeronautic agency entrusted from now on to civilians. His goal is to organize a response by sending a man into space before the USSR does. Werner von Braun takes the helm of the Mercury program. With Korolev, his Soviet rival, he'll have 10 years of bitter struggle. The future conquerors of space will be chosen from among 5,000 candidates, mostly fighter pilots from the American military. The seven selected astronauts are presented to the press at Dolly Madison House in Washington. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. 
Which of these men will be first to orbit the Earth? I cannot tell you. Smile, smile, they're prompted from the wings. Their names are Slayton, Carpenter, Cooper, Shearer, Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn. Television stations broadcast the event live. Well, all seven of the men are officers and test pilots, at three Air Force, three Navy, and one Marine. All are volunteers. I thought my father would be one, one of those seven that was going to be picked. How did you figure that? I just thought so. It's adulation for heroes who have yet to accomplish anything. Don't forget about me. The seven are now in the hands of the press. And they're not prepared for such publicity. Some of them fought during World War II. Others in the Korean War. They became test pilots on bases lost in the middle of the desert. A dangerous profession where the losses are close to 50%. Humiliated by the Sputniks, they're ready to risk their lives for the homeland. Life magazine has exclusivity on the inside story of this adventure in space. The astronauts will each be paid $25,000 a year. As soon as Life magazine is published on September 14, 1959, John Glenn becomes America's darling. He's like an evangelist. He speaks loud and clear. And he says that he'd be nothing without Annie, his wife. A week after the front cover with the astronauts, the one with their wives on it comes out. By contract, they had to reveal their private lives and their private thoughts that reporters and photographers are then ordered to polish up. They symbolize the perfect American woman. Life wants to show them as perfect housewives. It's John Glenn's wife, Annie Glenn, who best fits this image. Their training begins at Langley Base, Virginia. The tests will take place in Florida at Cape Canaveral. Get up, get up into the sky. Get up, get up, don't tell them why. Get up, get up into the sky. Get up, get up, don't tell them why. Get up, get up into the sky. Get up, get up, don't tell them why. Get up, get up into the sky. Get up, get up, don't tell them why. Get up, get up into the sky. The Cape's a huge, arid wasteland, out of bounds to wives. The work's hard, and in the evening, the astronauts seek to enjoy themselves. They go to Cocoa Beach, the nearest town, at the mercy of all kinds of flatterers who treat them to drinks and introduce them to girls. At the wheel of sports cars, they challenge one another on long, drunken joyrides. Competition is tough, both on the sporting level and with the female sex. Under the constant gaze of the photographers, they're soft targets. John Glenn keeps himself to himself. He goes to bed early and exercises at sunrise. His frank gaze tells a story, that of a man full of principles the astronaut must be irreproachable. His moralizing, pontificating annoys his fellow candidates, but America wouldn't accept scandal or divorce. Friends or rivals all ask the same question. Who'll be the first into space? Glenn is the media favorite. The seven visit the NASA sites in San Diego, where they discover the Atlas rocket and St. Louis to test their future spacecraft. 
Their excessive media coverage drains funds from industrialists and senators. When they see the mercury capsule for the first time, one of them remarks, doesn't this thing have wings? That's when they insist on a porthole, like on airplanes, as well as a manual hatch to get out of the capsule in case of emergency. They're pilots, not lab rats. Despite the efforts of NASA, the USSR maintains its lead in space missions. The Soviet lunar probes suffer heavy losses, but impose their leadership. Luna 1 misses the moon. But with Luna 2, for the first time in the history of humanity, a man-made machine reaches another celestial body. The moon. The same day, Nikita Khrushchev, on an official visit to the United States, learns of the success of his engineers. With irony, he gives President Eisenhower a replica of Luna 2 and declares to him, on the moon, the Soviet flag will be there to welcome yours because we'll be the first. When John Fitzgerald Kennedy succeeds Eisenhower, the astronauts are worried. Will Kennedy keep up the Mercury program? On the eve of the new president's inauguration, John Gilruth, in charge of the Mercury project, summons the seven astronauts. He asks them to nominate one of them. To retain a chance of being elected, everyone votes for anyone except for Glenn. In the end, it's Shepard who's designated. Grissom and Glenn are substitutes. This secret is to be kept until the day of departure. It's a snub for Glenn, and the beaten competitor goes home to Dallas. Nothing of his pain shows. The car radio broadcasts the new president's oath of office. Signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God. This wounded man will be Alan Shepard's exemplary crewmate. And when a reporter threatens to reveal that one of them has been to a Mexican prostitute, Glenn convinces the newspaper not to publish the news. But he warns the team we must succeed together. Despite his disappointment, Glenn remains an upright man. To put people off the scent, the astronauts carry on performing the same tasks. The journalists speculate on who will get to take off. Glenn just keeps on smiling like a winner. You can just see a touch of bitterness when the cameras turn away from him. Shepard's first flight's scheduled for January 1961. But Von Braun will decide otherwise. On January the 31st, a chimpanzee is sent into space. His name is Chang. To make him more American, he's renamed Ham. He comes from Cameroon, and he's five years old. Stuck in the capsule, his role's to push a lever. When he succeeds, he's rewarded with banana chips. And if he's wrong, it's an electrical shock he's shaken with. A six-minute flight to an altitude of 250 kilometers, and thus America's number one astronaut is a monkey. When Ham returns, he's aggressive, so he's given a sedative for the press conference. The Great Monkey Adventure, that's the name given to Ham's flight, and public opinion ridicules the astronauts. 
At dawn on April the 12th, 1961, the editor of a daily wakes up the director of NASA, who shouts, we're all asleep here. In the morning, the headline on the front page of the newspaper reads, Soviet cosmonaut flies in space and the United States sleeps. You're going to be the first man in space, he'd been told that morning. The man in question is Yuri Gagarin. He's 27 years old. He's the son of a dairy worker and a carpenter, become a fighter pilot. Khrushchev chose him because he best represents the communist ideal. The five-ton Vostok capsule is tiny, and Gagarin hardly fits in. Moved, he confides, all my childhood I dreamed of this moment. flies over Japan and Alaska, where an American listening station records his conversation with Korolev, the leader of Soviet flights. The flight lasts 108 minutes at a speed of 28,000 kilometers an hour. Back on Earth, Gagarin says, I didn't meet God. The only one to react is John Glenn. We received a kick in the pants, no use closing our eyes to it. He just swallows the rage of not being the first. Five days later, Kennedy suffers a bitter failure in Cuba, an attempt to land anti-Castorists at the Bay of Pigs. He had approved this CIA operation. Even if he didn't initiate the operation, he bears the brunt of the whole world's anger, and this setback affects him. May 2nd, 1961, rains pouring down on Cape Canaveral. In Hangar S, Alan Shepard wakes up at 1 a.m. All night long, he's had nightmares of rockets exploding. Shepard is tense, nervous that doctors might detect the least infection. So John Glenn, his backup, would have to replace him. At breakfast, he swallows orange juice, filet mignon with bacon, and scrambled eggs. At five in the morning, journalists still don't know the name of the one who'll take off, but Glenn remains the front runner. The rain hasn't stopped, so the flight's postponed. Shepard comes back down. He drinks a glass of cognac. It's over for today. It takes 48 hours to empty the liquid oxygen that feeds the redstone rocket. NASA then decides to reveal the identity of the first astronaut. Shepard is relieved. Alan B. Shepard was in the pilot preparation area waiting for instructions, but Mother Nature wouldn't cooperate. The scenario is repeated three days later. Shepard awakening in the middle of the night again. He phones his wife, Louise, and to reassure her, he promises to wave to her from the porthole. Come back soon, darling. I love you. Louise knows that he's risking his life, but she doesn't want to give in to anxiety. She has confidence in Alan. 
Latin North hangar in the specially equipped transportation van, and then he journeys to the Atlantic. Shepard looks up. He wants to fix this image in his memory. Glenn jokes with Shepard. He passes him a note. No playing baseball during the flight. Boats and helicopters crisscross the sea landing zone. For the 300 journalists, the suspense is total. A man is locked up in a capsule, and everything might explode. Nearly 500,000 people are praying for Freedom 7, the name Shepard has given his spaceship. The NBC reporter comments, he looks so lonely up there. Roger. A first interruption of four hours. After that, Alan feels the urge to go to the toilet. The flight was to last only 15 minutes, but with waiting. The control room hesitates and then gives him permission to relieve himself on the spot, despite the risk of a short circuit. The countdown resumes. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. Yes, sir, reading it loud and clear. Shepard spent only a few minutes in space at an altitude of 187 kilometers. Hello, Captain Three and Seven. How do you read? The main suit is good. The rate of descent is reading about 35 feet per second. A helicopter retrieves Shepard from the Atlantic Ocean and places him on the aircraft carrier Lake Champlain. Engineers and doctors take Alan in hand. Shepard's flight didn't have the expected resonance. Gagarin is overshadowing him. So the White House bigs up the feet and arranges an ostentatious celebration of the first American astronaut. Today even surpasses last Friday. And as a matter of fact, I got far less sleep last night than I did the night before the flight. <laughs> The president's especially keen to erase memories of his Bay of Pigs fiasco with a spectacular announcement. So he asks Vice President Lyndon Johnson in charge of the space program. And it's the engineer Von Braun who provides the answer. Yes, it's possible to send a man to the moon within the decade. Shepard's success is also reflected on his wife. Louise is fascinated by how chic Jackie Kennedy is. Jackie shows her around the White House. <laughs> On her return to Texas, Louise will be able to answer the other astronauts' wives who want to know what was Mrs. Kennedy like. She looks like me, and like me, she wears size 8 shoes. They're all jealous of the first lady of space. 
Kennedy announces his ambition to go to the moon before the end of the decade. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The Senate votes in a budget for the Apollo program unanimously. Kennedy's crazy, say the astronauts. We have neither rocket nor capsule to go there. A week later, JFK meets Khrushchev in Europe, in Vienna. Khrushchev abruptly demands the withdrawal of American troops from West Berlin. He claims to be pointing more than a thousand missiles at the West, but he's bluffing. The American secret services have proof. Then Khrushchev gets friendly and offers as a gift to Jackie Pushinka, the alleged puppy of a Sputnik 5 passenger. A month and a half later, the second mission, that of Gus Grissom, is announced as a repetition of the previous one. Gus Grissom is the rebel of the bunch. He's the 35-year-old son of a railway worker who has worked hard, fought in Korea, and wants to manage his family life as he pleases. The reporters are not so happy with him. Grissom doesn't cooperate to the despair of NASA. He considers that he hasn't attained the perfection of Glenn or Shepard, but he's a peerless technician. Thanks to him, his vessel, the Liberty Bell, is equipped with a manual exit hatch and a real window that will allow him to see Earth. The Redstone rocket doesn't have the power to put a capsule into orbit. And unlike the Russians, Gus reaches an altitude of only 185 kilometers. Seen from above, the beauty of the scenery takes his breath away. He's on the verge of tachycardia. Charlie, you got a time here? Uh, Roger, flight, uh, area Charlie, at nine plus two zero. Ball angle on the right. The sea landing's going smoothly. Until the moment, explosives force the door open and water floods the capsule. Gus is drowning and extracts himself with difficulty. His distress signals are taken for friendly waves. The capsule's lost. No information, no photo survives the sinking. Engineers hold him responsible. He's accused of having lost his head when he opened the door prematurely. That shit went off by itself, he repeats. On the phone, the first thing his wife asks him is, you didn't do anything stupid, did you, Gus? The press ask questions. His comrades support him. Gus almost disappeared. But behind his back it said, Gus messed up. When Betty Grissom and her children meet up with Gus, she realizes that the party planned won't take place. All she's entitled to is a meal at the camp canteen and a night in a motel. The journalists talk only about the hatch. Betty's outraged, but puts on a brave face despite the coldness of the authorities. 
She feels sorry for Gus. No visit to the White House, no Jackie or parade. Betty is in tears. Just 16 days after Grissom's flight, Commander German Titov makes 17 orbits over 24 hours aboard Vostok 2. This is the Soviet's answer. We're still the best. Unlike the Americans, the Russians disclose only a few poor staged images. And they refrain from mentioning the nausea that affected Titov during the 25 hours spent in his vessel. The Russians may master the power of rockets, but the Vostok capsules are heavy and bulky. They're always one step ahead, though. Newspaper headlines tell the story. German Titov of Russia returns to Earth after orbiting the globe 17 times in a little more than 25 hours. I think it's about time America woke up and did something about it. Then we should do everything possible to make any sacrifice to help our country be get up there too. And we certainly need to start working hard to catch up. A week later, on the morning of August the 13th, 1961, Soviet troops start building the Berlin Wall, separating the city into two zones. In doubt, Kennedy makes no move in the face of Khrushchev's audacity. Then Moscow tries to destabilize the American space program. A book published in East Germany reveals that the engineer von Braun is the one who manufactured the V-2 missiles in the service of Hitler in order to bombard England. It explains that in 1945, the German scientist and his team of engineers were recruited by the U.S. military and sent to the U.S. to develop rockets. The know-how of Americans, but also Russians, comes from technologies developed under the Third Reich. Von Braun pursues his goal of conquering the moon, and he becomes the project manager of the American space program. It's he who developed the Redstone rocket used by Shepard and Grissom. This is a model of the US Army's Redstone. But von Braun is now an American citizen, and the attempt at destabilization's cut short. After Titov's success, NASA has no choice. It must take the risk of flying beyond an orbit of the Earth. For this, it banks on a cursed rocket that's been behind a lot of accidents, the launcher Atlas. To the honor of NASA and the American space program, the next astronaut, John Glenn, accepts. The John Glenn story. Glenn, a former World War II and Korean fighter pilot born in Cambridge, Ohio, will become legendary even before making his first space flight. At 40, he's the holder of the supersonic speed record between LA and New York City three hours and 23 minutes. At 9 a.m., Marine Airman Major John Glenn begins an attempt at a supersonic transcontinental flight. His Crusader jet camera plane leaves Los Alamitos, California, headed nonstop for New York. NASA turns him into a hero because one is needed to face the Russian rival in a single combat worthy of knights in shining armor. Journalists invade his hometown and track down witnesses to his life. John played football right here on this field. He was an excellent student, or an example for all Americans to follow. The flight's scheduled for December the 20th, 1961. A Christmas gift from NASA.
Bad weather, however, and technical problems postponed liftoff until February the 20th, 1962. His flight will be rescheduled nine times. He receives tens of thousands of letters for Christmas, and the crowd continues to camp on the dunes of Cape Canaveral. On February the 19th, 1962, Glenn goes to sleep in Hangar S, NASA's den. The night's calm, and he's cradled by Madame Butterfly, his favorite melody. On the morning of the 20th, Glenn gets up at 1.30. Fillet of beef and scrambled eggs in the company of Deke Slayton, the next man on the departures list. The nurse, Dolores O'Hara, is one of the only women admitted into Hangar S. Nary an examination, nary a blood test without her. She's their confidant. That day, she conceals as best she can the gravity of the moment. Glenn goes over and over the checklist in his head and studies the weather reports. At five o'clock in the morning, the hundred people present applaud him. Walter Cronkite back at the CBS News Control Center at Cape Canaveral. A wind of around 15 knots, which is just about uh, maximum for a permissible, safe flight. At two hours from liftoff, Glenn strives to perform small, familiar gestures, like adjusting his microphone. In the capsule, he's nicknamed Friendship 7. A mirror allows him to see the sky. The astronaut Scott Carpenter puts him in touch with his wife and two children. And he's bearing up in front of her television in Arlington. The family's as tight as ever. Carpenter, his old friend, his replacement, wishes him good luck and starts the final count. Godspeed, John Glenn. How you doing? The external umbilical cord has now been removed from the Atlas missile. We notice that several of the secretaries of the Space Administration have their heads bowed in a prayer for the astronaut. T minus 10 seconds, counting. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three. The Atlas missile has lifted off from the pad and is rising steady into the sky. The MA6 vehicle has lifted off. Trajectory looks good. Going straight up into the sky. Oh, that view is tremendous. 
The whole geography of the globe is spread out before him. Uh, the sunset was beautiful. It went down very rapidly. John takes photos with his camera bought at the neighborhood supermarket. Unlike fighter pilots who speak only in monosyllables, John describes what he sees. Uh, the redness of the sunset I can still see through some of the clouds. Uh, the sky above is absolutely black, completely black. During the first orbit, he watches the sun set over the Indian Ocean. A thin blue line marks the horizon. Then the emerald water of the Bahamas appears as the night fades away. The snowy peaks, the volcanoes, the storms, the city lights. Eighty-nine minutes later, on the second orbit, Glenn's blinded by thousands of pins clustered against his porthole, glowing fireflies like signs from extraterrestrials. The phenomenon disappears and then comes back. The control room is worried. Suddenly, one, two bumps. The NASA engineers detect a problem. Due to the poorly secured thermal shield, the ship risks disintegration on re-entering the atmosphere. His return is speeded up. The astronaut goes through a fireball. His heart rate's at 109. Everyone's waiting for the radio signal. Shepard repeats his calls, his pleas. The whole room rejoices. Glenn's heart's pounding at 134 beats a minute. On sea landing, John Glenn's gestures are a coded sign on television for Annie, his wife. Annie, I love you. The sailors mark with paint the very spot where Glenn set foot on the ship to preserve the memory. The destiny of John Glenn's going to be radically changed forever. Soon he'll leave NASA to become a senator and support Bobby Kennedy in his electoral campaigns. Senator John H. Glenn, Jr., United States Marine Corps. In Washington, he's welcomed by 250,000 people and 4 million Americans on Broadway. His presence electrifies the crowd. He's the symbol of a victorious America. With this flight, the lag behind the Soviets is effaced, and in Glenn, America finds a hero. They all dream of this recognition by the American people. But during a routine checkup, Deke Slayton is forbidden to fly due to a weak heart. Thanks to the influence of John Glenn, he's appointed Mercury astronaut manager. Nonetheless, he remains at the feet of glory. And it's Scott Carpenter who takes over his mission. Scott must trace the path of John's flight by making three orbits of the Earth. In addition, he's in charge of testing a new food, vacuum-packed ham, whose radioactivity makes it possible to follow its progression in his stomach. But it's Renee, his wife, who benefits from his fame. 
blonde and elegant, she becomes the icon of East Coast magazines. In private, President Kennedy believes she is the sexiest of the astronauts' wives. Renee has decided to take control of her image by defying the barons of NASA. Going beyond the contract with Life magazine, she'll write her own story of life with Scott. She wants to be the first to attend with their children the departure of her husband from Cape Canaveral, even though it's out of bounds to wives. I've always shared difficult moments with Scott, she says. When she wakes up on the morning of the launch, Scott's already gone. She leads the photographer who shadows her all the time onto the beach to watch the rocket lift off. The photos will be even more beautiful. In orbit at 28,000 kilometers per hour, Carpenter's having fun. I have the fireflies. Under the spell of what he's seeing for a first time, Carpenter loses count of time and uses too much fuel. And when he triggers his retro rockets a few seconds late, he doesn't have enough energy to straighten his trajectory. At 400 kilometers from the planned location, Carpenter's losing it, drifting off course. His silence goes on forever. We've lost an astronaut. But Rene, as a good pilot's wife, will have none of it. A pilot's never dead until his body's identified. And looking on the dark sides, just not her style. Carpenter's life rafts located a few hours later. Grinning, he greets the rescue team with a detached air, camera in hand. NASA doesn't forgive his glib nonchalance, and a bureaucrat says Carpenter will never fly again. Because from now on, the caprices of astronauts of the Mercury program are an inconvenience in high places. Carpenter failed. It's because he had the presumption to replace the machine by flying it himself. Because of Rene's popularity, the carpenters are received at the White House. She'll become a television producer and will be with Bobby Kennedy the day of his assassination. Like a ghost in the forest. In July 1962, NASA's headquarters is moved to Houston, Texas. Media coverage of its astronauts eclipses the Soviets. The humiliation caused by the Sputniks is about to be avenged by simple fighter pilots become legends, thanks to Life magazine. And by their wives, attached to the privileges and gifts they receive. Like a burning horizon, you keep me flying away. In Cuba, over the 13-day missile crisis, Kennedy forces Khrushchev to back down, and people reckon he saved world peace.
The Soviet's response will be the first woman in space, and her name is Valentina. Valentina Terechkova. She's 26 years old. She's a young textile worker whom Khrushchev chose himself. But Valentina's above all a propaganda tool. She shows the whole world that Soviet woman is the most modern and the most emancipated. And just looking at Renee Carpenter, the image of the American woman seems kind of old fashioned. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Henceforth, nine new astronauts join the space program. Alongside the military, there are now geologists, doctors, physicists. Among them, Neil Armstrong, a young test pilot from Ohio. With him, Frank Borman, James Lowell, Ed White, all selected for the new Gemini program. The Mercury 7 pioneers have fulfilled their role. The guys from Gemini and Apollo take over with the mission to conquer the moon.